Hello, this is Trust Focused Podcast called Trustcast. Welcome to our Trustcast. Listening podcast with Dr. Adela Drozdivog, produced at Queensland University of Technology, Center for Future Enterprise. Trustcast is produced as part of our research efforts focused on trust governance and management. In our first episode, we are welcoming Anne Todd. Anne is director of Alexa Trust at Amazon since 2020. However, this engagement is not the only one that represents her work on trust. Anne has over two decades of professional experience in this area, including but not limited to the role of Chief Trust Officer at Yahoo, her work with Google, Slack, World Economic Forum, and so on. Anne is considered as a groundbreaker and leader in understanding trust. Therefore, we are pleased to host her as our inaugural guest. Hello, Anne. Welcome to the Trustcast. Thank you. Now, Anne, I believe you were trend leader here or a groundbreaker, like we already introduced you. So you were one of the first, if not even the first chief trust officer. We would like to know more about this role. We would like to learn how corporations came to realize that trust is so important, not only to be managed, but also to be governed. Please elaborate on on the process and the bits you find very important in this context. I was, I believe, the very first fully dedicated privacy person at any internet company. And that ultimately led to my becoming chief privacy officer at Yahoo. Now, I sort of began to realize that the word privacy had different meanings to different people. It sort of depends on where you come from, what generation you're in. But as soon as you say the word privacy, people begin to think about all of the things that they've done that they don't want you to know. And it's and, and it, it tends to sort of play into the negative. And so I, I made a very conscious decision um, when I was at Yahoo to to ask to be the chief trust officer, because I would rather think about the thing that we're trying to build, the thing we're trying to maximize with our customer, which is ultimately trust. Um, And that means you could do a number of different things with data. You could do different things uh, in terms of the, the, the way you present your content, but ultimately it's about building that trust with the customer. So it was around 2010, that I uh, carried that title at Yahoo. And I think, again, I think I might have been one of the very first people to use that title professionally. And so that was how we thought about it back in the day and how it evolved. And I think a lot of other companies have similarly come to realize that trust is a very important part of that value that consumers get or that you get with consumers, that relationship you have. Thank you, Anne. So... We mentioned uh, that privacy is part of trust. And um, to my understanding now, what we are saying is that chief trust officer role originated from the role focused on privacy of data and, and the role focused on data handling. So in order to understand this better for all our listeners, um, it would be great if you can elaborate on your understanding of trust. Is privacy a part of trust? Is it supporting trust in relationship with your consumers? How do you see it? Privacy is just one dimension of trust. There are a lot of different aspects to it. But when you think about it, it's a bit like it's a bit like an iceberg. Your, your, your privacy policy and your public statements about privacy are just the tip of the iceberg. Once you make those statements to customers and you make those promises to them, You then have to build a governance program internally to make sure that you're actually doing the things you say you're doing. And that's 99.9% of the work is actually making sure that everything is consistent with what you've said. Um, And so that's where that's where that's where all the teams really have to come together is in making sure that you're doing what you say you're doing. Mm -hmm. So what I heard here is that coordination will matter and cooperation between different teams will matter as well. 
but we are very focused on consumer trust and uh, trust in that relationship with consumer. But I'm also interested, are there other layers? Are there other relationships that are relevant here? And how do you go around uh, team coordination and these relationships? Uh, well, there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different layers to it. Ultimately, the relationship is between the, the company, the service, and the customer who's using it. That's the most important piece. But in order to deliver that experience to the customer, there's a lot of coordination that happens behind the scenes. Um, a big part of my role has been to be that connective tissue between external stakeholders and product people within the organization. So I'm within the Alexa product organization, but I work closely with public policy, with our public relations team and communications team in order to understand sort of what advocacy organizations are thinking, what policymakers are thinking, bring that input into the organization, and then in turn explain to external stakeholders how we're thinking about building our products and services, how we think about privacy, how we think about uh, trust overall with our customers. It's to basically be that go-between um, because more and more this space has been regulated. Globally, there are more than 100 different national privacy laws that are in effect. Um, and so it's not just about being compliant with the law, but about going that next step to meet our customers' expectations and explaining how we do that. I think that a lot of these topics, as technology becomes more and more sophisticated, consumers look to external uh, influencers. They look to technologists. They look to uh, experts from, from the advocacy world to help tell them what they should be worried about. So it's important to us to make sure that all of those different constituencies understand how we're approaching this so that they at least have a, a degree of understanding of how we are prioritizing these, these issues internally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to learn that multiple different layers or relationships, however you call them, are important in trust governance and trust management. However, it would be great if you can also comment on how is consistent message ensured. We are very well aware that that consistency is important in trust building, uh, therefore trust governance as well. So it would be great to learn how Amazon as such a large corporation ensures this. Amazon is has a number of very diverse businesses. Um, the one thing that joins the entire company together is the leadership principles. And they're quite publicly known. And one of them is customer obsession and putting the customer first. So while we each have different businesses, whether it's retail, whether it's grocery, whether it's devices and services, we have books, we have Twitch, there are lots of different businesses. We're unified in that our priorities are aligned with our leadership principles and the way we think about serving the customer, the way we think about the way we operate internally. So that is sort of the common vocabulary that binds us. So even if I don't know the people who are working on all these issues in other parts of the organization, we are all basically marching to the same to the same tune because that, because we're aligned in the way we work uh, throughout the company. Now, this was on the level of entire Amazon as a corporation. What about the level of Alexa? How do we ensure trust is accounted for or acknowledged or trust with consumer is really embedded uh, while building products and services? Within my part of Amazon, we're building devices, hardware devices, and software that goes with those hardware devices. So we're building smart speakers, we're building devices with cameras, uh, with microphones, uh, robots. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are working on all of those things. So you have to coordinate with all dimension of product development because the people who are building the hardware have to think about how to incorporate privacy preserving features. So as an example, because you can see me on camera, you can see that I have a device with a screen with a red line underneath it. That red light indicates that that particular device has been muted. So when you press the mute button, it's actually a hardware feature. It's not a software feature. This device is developed so that if that red light is on, the wiring makes it impossible for the microphone to be active. And you can take the device apart and you can test that. When we build devices with cameras, we have a physical shutter. You can slide over the camera so that you have physical control over the device and you know it can't be misused in that way. So those are 
product development choices that are happening at the very beginning of product development. Those requirements are given to our hardware teams who are building the hardware. In addition, we have other software protections that we put in place in terms of the features that we build, the, the controls that we have in our app, on the screens, on the devices that are software-based as well. So there are product requirements at every stage of product development that require coordination across different teams to build, and not just in the feature set, but also in the systems that ultimately store the data to make sure that they are also man, uh, compliant with all of the requirements that we've either publicly asserted to our customers or internally have developed in order to make sure that we're, we're compliant, either with regulatory obligations or just to our customer promises. So it's a lot of internal coordination, but but that's that's how that's how the sausage gets made, <laughs> as we say, um, when you're making products. Mm -hmm. So now within this, uh, you have mentioned that there are hardware controls, so almost like mechanical control over privacy, where users can shut the camera or see the red line that symbolizes that hardware is not connected to record a uh, video or audio. In addition to this, you also mentioned there are some software features you built in uh, for better privacy control. Can you can you elaborate on these? One of the things that we've done um, in the last year or two going back is really acknowledging the fact that this is a voice-based service. So why shouldn't you be able to use voice to access your or to manage your privacy controls? So you can say things like Alexa, delete everything I ever said. Alexa, delete everything I said today. Alexa, why did you do that? Um, and so- Alexa, delete the recordings of everything you said to me today. <laughs> See? Is that right? No. Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's an example of how it works, right? So you can say that and, uh, and Alexa will respond in kind. So those are features that we've built to make it easier for our customers to engage with those controls. So we have a long list of, of, of accomplishments that we've been able to put out in the world in terms of features and, and controls and awareness and education. Yes, yes, I agree. Consumer education in this area is quite relevant and it is quite important for consumer to understand their control over their privacy. However, I would also like to do a step back in this conversation to ensure that we capture our overall understanding of trust. What is overall trust about? And are there other elements than other than privacy that we should pay attention to in this conversation? Trust overall is has a lot to do with customer experience. It has a lot to do with the ways in which we present options to a customer, the ways in which we show you what data we have about you, et cetera. So I, I do think that transparency is, is a very sort of foundational element of how you maintain trust because it's, it's basically saying to a customer, here's what I know about you. I think a lot of the problems that we have, uh, at least when it comes to the world of data, is that there is a pretty significant asymmetry between what a consumer knows that a company knows about them. So the more that, and, and more and more, I think in part because of uh, data subject access requests and other regulatory requirements that have come into play in the last few years, consumers have more information now about what companies know about them. And in some cases that's been a surprise to some customers, but in the case of the product we're building with, with Alexa, we've been really clear in, in showing customers, here are all the voice recordings that we have. Here's your ability to access and delete them. And in being that open and transparent about what we have, it helps to level that playing field so that you know what we know. And that I think is, is one way to help, to help engender trust. We also uh, develop policy for content. So when you ask a question of, of the service, you will get, you, you can say, you know, when is the next Manchester United game, you know, and we'll give you an answer. But in order to do that, you know, we have to, there's a whole process for taking that speech that you, that what you said, your utterance, turning it into text. So automatic speech recognition is a process where we try to figure out what did you say? And then we have a process to try to understand, well, what did you mean by what you just said? And then we have to go find an answer to that. Um, and then it goes right back through that system again. And in that process, we're trying to be relevant. We're trying to be timely, accurate, 
And it's also a recognition of the fact that, you know, these are devices that are in people's households. So we want to make sure that we're not returning something because there's a lot of stuff on the internet that you probably don't want repeated back in your household. So we're also trying to be cognizant of that as well. So there are a number of content policies that apply uh, to the to the content we return to make sure that it's it meets all of our criteria. So my team helps work on policies around that as well. And so it's a lot of different areas that are really bound together by the fact that it's all about that customer interaction and about will the customer get in return to their query a thing that is appropriate, timely, and what they expected? Um, and will we use that data in a way that, that again, meets with their expectations? So it's a variety of different policy areas that are really, that are joined together by the fact that they come right back to building trust with that customer. Elaborating on these uh, content policies, you mentioned it's important for you to be relevant, timely, accurate, and cognizant, or or sometimes that even means family-friendly. Um, you mentioned that appropriate answers are relevant. Now, appropriate doesn't always mean the, the same thing. Appropriate in different situations or under different contingencies might might mean a different answer. So how do you go along uh, different situations and providing relevant, accurate and timely answers and cognizant in that context, and even in, even in the context of the recent uh, political debates? Political events and uh, movements. I mean, we had in the United States, there was a lot of discussion of do Black lives matter? Do all lives matter? There's a lot of discussion around that. And a lot of thought went into the appropriate response for that question that was reflective of not just what was out there, but what we thought was the right way for Alexa to respond to that question. Um, And, you know, it can be, I think more and more current events are dramatically shifting the types of content that people want to engage with that surfaces, whether it's because of events that are currently happening in Eastern Europe or events that are happening in uh, the middle, in, in the middle East or in China. I mean, all of these things will force us to revisit some of these fundamental questions on a regular basis of what is the right, what is the appropriate action to take? What is the right path forward? And it's, it's interesting because they're hard questions and they're not always simple answers to those hard questions. So it makes, it makes work. It makes, it makes our work very interesting. And, and I think very important because of that. So now on a bit lighter note, after, after mentioning political situation, um, I was thinking about this cognizant dimension of Alexa answers, and you mentioned that that might be something appropriate for the home, therefore family-friendly answer, but still needs to be accurate. So I remember a clip I've seen on some of the social media where a child is asking Alexa, are reindeers flying and are they real? And in that moment, you could see a father jumping out from the chair, trying to be louder than Alexa's answer. So I'm wondering, how are you navigating around being accurate, uh, but still being family friendly um, in situations like this in the time of Christmas? Yeah, I think during the Christmas season, they're always, you know, they're, I mean, it's surprising because people also remember people can access their purchases on Amazon through their devices. And so during the Christmas holiday season, you have to be particularly cognizant of, of, uh, of what you show your customers so that you don't uh, accidentally reveal someone's holiday surprises to them too soon. But yes, yes, there are lots of questions, but is Santa Claus real? And, um, and we don't want, we don't want anyone's, anyone's child to be, you know, to find out that the tooth fairy doesn't exist because Alexa told them that. So there, there are a lot of things that we're thinking about that, maybe don't always come up in the context of other services, which is part of what makes it interesting to work on this particular product. I believe there are many interesting examples. Uh, However, we are reaching the end of our gathering uh, of this Trustcast episode one. And for the end, I would actually like to ask you, what is your vision of trust governance in future? How do you see this not only as an occupation chief trust officer, how do you see it evolving, but uh, trust governance in general, how do you see where is it going and where should it be going by your opinion? The vision for it? Well, I've gotten to see so much of it evolve in the last few years. 
to see it elevated at a very, I mean, there's so many different dimensions of the work and a lot of it has been well behind the scenes for a very long time. In the last five years in particular, there's just been a real focus on thinking about this from the standpoint of responsible innovation. How are you thinking about not just data collection and use, but the unintended consequences of some of the technology you're building? How are you thinking about, uh, about the consequences of the design choices that you're making and the way people are interacting with content? What content are you surfacing? How are your algorithms being used? How is machine learning really happening? What are your biases? How are you thinking about uh, about them, are you aware of of the of the way in which, whether it's we think about concepts of fairness. Ultimately, it's not just about trust. It's not just about privacy. It's not just about uh, the content issues. They are much larger questions of how do we build technology, not just to be trustworthy, but to be safe, to be reliable, to be. I think the word ethical comes to mind. Responsible innovation. How do we build these products? How do we ensure that if you build it for this one use case, that, that you can ensure that it's used for the way in which you intended? Because as we've seen with technology, there are lots, there are lots of well-intended products that are often used in ways that aren't as you expected. And how do you, how do you respond as a company to that? And how do you continue to, to innovate in a, in a way that will engender trust with your customers, especially in light of the fact that I think um, we as an industry had a real, like the tech lash in the last few years about thinking, well, wow, you know, maybe all this technology isn't good for us. You know, so that's definitely raised a lot of questions about how we think about what we put into the world and the responsibility that comes with it. That is not one person's job, right? That's everybody's job. And so making sure that everybody is thinking about that is I think what's, what's important. And I think technologists, feel more than ever the weight of the responsibility of what they're building and what they're putting into the world. I love all of the stories about the ways in which we make people's lives better. I want that to be what we, what we, what we leave with. Right. So, um, so, and I'm still an optimist. I'm an internal optimist because I've seen all of the amazing things that technology can do for people. And I want to make sure that we continue to be able to do that. So, so I don't know if I answered your question, um, I just think that if we've do, if we've done our job right, we've influenced a lot of how we develop product, not just in the context of one group working on policy for one product, but really getting everyone to think about all of these different dimensions of the technology that they build. While listening to this, uh, your future vision of trust governance, especially in the context of technological firms and digital data, the expression greater good kept coming to my mind. Uh, am I right here? Well, I hope so. I hope so. It's, it's, uh, it's all about building technology. In, you know, when I was at the World Economic Forum, it was about emphasizing the use of technology to improve the public good and, and I think that's uh, when we do our jobs right, that's the, that's the beauty of building technology is being able to see real change in people's lives in a positive way. Well, thank you, Anne. I cannot express enough my gratitude to this very contentful conversation. I'd like to thank you in front of our QT Center for Future Enterprise in, in my name and in the name of our audience. Sure, sure. I'm just excited you're doing this research. I think it's a great area to explore. And anything I can do to be helpful, just let me know. Thank you again. And thanks to our audience who were listening to our conversation today. You were listening to Trust-focused podcast called Trustcast produced at Queensland University of Technology, Center for Future Enterprise by Dr. Adela Trostivop.